listening to Make It, a podcast by Bonsai Creative that helps aspiring professionals in film get where they're going faster by dissecting the advice, knowledge, and insights of professional creatives in the film industry. I'm your host, Chris Barkley. Hey, my name is Robert Broadhurst. I'm a writer, director. You may know me from my short film called An Occurrence at Arvern. And right now I'm working on several scripts and a bunch of commercial projects. Robert Broadhurst, welcome to the Make It Podcast. Thank you, sir. Nice to be here. Oh, it is nice uh, to to be with you. Um, Super talented. I want to give the audience a little bit more background on you. So I'm going to read a little bit from your bio. Uh, Robert is an East Coast suburb raised Brooklyn based filmmaker. He earned his MFA in filmmaking from Columbia University, where the short films he wrote, produced and edited played festivals from Tribeca to the Toronto International Film Festival. After film school, he worked as an editor in formats from commercials to trailers to fashion and broadcast docudramas. Following his work on Kanye West's first three Yeezy fashion launches, he made the move to directing with campaign films for Adidas Y3, Alexander Wang, and Armani Beauty, among others. He returned to narrative filmmaking with An Occurrence at Arvern his first short film as a writer and director. And Robert, we are going to talk about that award-winning short film and occurrence at Arvern throughout this conversation, but I want to start here. How did you get the nickname RG, if I'm pronouncing that correctly? RG. Yes, as a a kid. Arge. Yeah. That's from my sister. That's a nickname she gave me. How did you find that? (laughs) That's what we do here at the Make It Podcast. That's shocking um, and, uh, and and highly sensitive information. Um, my parents called me RJ when I was a kid because mm-hmm. my full name was Robert James. And my little sister ca- started calling me Arj. Um, but when the RJ was phased into my actual name, which is Robert, um, the only person who still called me Arj and still does to this day is my sister. That's amazing. I, I assume RJ is for Robert James, right? You got it. Yeah, it's wonderful. Well, I appreciate you sharing that information. Uh, I know that was sort of a <laughs> a fun and, and a way to start this conversation, and probably in a direction you didn't know. But I do want to stay on on the early days here because I'm curious. When was that moment for you? How, how did you find film? And when did you know you really wanted to do this? That's a great question. I, I think I saw Ghostbusters in the theater, you know, somewhere between four and eight times. <laughs> um, and I think that was the first time I, I became fanatical about, about something. And Ghostbusters was a big phenomenon. I obviously wasn't alone in my fanaticism for that movie, but um but that I thought was a, that, uh, I turned a corner with that one, I would say. And, and because it was so effects laden um, and there were so many aspects to the craft of that film. Um, and there was like a fair amount of information available on it at the time. You'd see little news segments and stuff about the special effects. It just, it, it made me super interested in, in the process of making and the fact that, you know, people had come together and creatively um, not only come up with the script and the characters and the story and all that, but, but, you know, solved all of the creative problems that abound when you're making something as monumental as a movie like that. And um, from then, you know, I had, I think I probably had like a closeted filmmaking desire for a long time. It still felt far fetched. It still felt like something that other people somewhere else might do. And I, you know, I came from a pretty cookie cutter town and uh, people out there weren't making movies um, so, so yeah, it was, it was a long time gestating of, I'd, I'd really like to do that. And then I think when like Tarantino happened in the nineties exploded with independent film, it felt like something that was actually viable. Yeah. And you grew up in Connecticut, correct? Yeah. Connecticut. And before that Chicago and Boston. 
Yeah. And so definitely small town. Um, but it is interesting how it is movies like Ghostbusters. For me, the movie was Princess Bride. And oh, the uh, best. <laughs> right. And and then maybe even like maybe a 1A would be Ferris Bueller's Day Off. So it's not these, it's not on Golden Pond. And it's not like, <laughs> it's not the, when you, when you first get that bug when you're young, it's something, it's, it's, it's something much lighter than that, that hooks you and gets you like a Ghostbusters. And I have had several friends in, in this business tell me that Ghostbusters was the movie for them. It was the one that kind of turned it around for them. Right. Um, I know you had a father-in-law that worked extensively in the film industry, but I'm wondering if you had anyone else in your family, maybe your mom or your dad that was in film. And if not, who inspired you to go into filmmaking? Um, first I, again, I have to laud your research. It's deep and frightening and very good. Um, yes, my father-in-law, uh, his career has been as a line producer, as a producer of various sorts, uh, often as a line producer, my own parents, uh, no, my dad is, a, you know, um, a thoughtful, uh, I think creative person, but his career has, was, has not been creative. Um, it's, it's been in sort of the straight business world, although mm -hmm. a lot of creative problem solving, he's a brilliant, uh, brilliant guy has a vision, for a landscape. I can tell you that. Um, and my mom, my mom is super creative. Um, my dad likes to say that my mom wasn't creative until she discovered that I was creative and that she <laughs> suddenly became creative uh, by osmosis retroactively, but, um, but she's super creative and, and always has projects going on. Um, yeah. So, so there was a lot of creativity in my house, although not professional creativity. It's a, hey, just ask. You know, it's interesting because we do find that um, a lot of times uh, a creative person is born from people who weren't necessarily in that field, but um, embraced their children doing whatever they wanted to do. And oftentimes, you grow up, you don't want to be who your parents are. You want to sort of, you know, blaze your own trail. And as long as you have those parents that are supportive of that dream early. You can, you can definitely go do that. Uh, before you got into narrative filmmaking, you uh, were, uh, as I mentioned in your bio, in the commercial world. You've worked with so many brands. I mean, the bio just sort of scratches the surface. And uh, for we'll, we'll give links so people can see some of your commercial work. But it is extremely lush and it's exciting. And uh, you really use a lot of technique in these. And one of the things I've noticed is that you have these strong female protagonists, almost dominant sort of motif. Um, why is that? And how did that come to you? Great question. Um, <clears throat> and, and it's, it's nice that you've noticed that. Um, I, yeah. I mean, well, I, I believe in strong female protagonists, I suppose. Um, you know, my mother is a, a strong personality and uh, a strong female protagonist in, in her own way, in her own world. And um you know, I admire, I admire women. <laughs> uh, that, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's that simple. I, I think, uh, you know, obviously the, uh, we're living in a patriarchy and, uh, historically pretty dense and deep one and anything I can do to sort of elevate women, um, is, is something I'm going to do if I can. Uh, I also, also aesthetically, I think it's, I think there's just a lot of ways to render, uh, a woman, a girl, whoever in, in interesting, powerful ways. I think there's a lot of interesting things that can be done with lighting that maybe have typically been reserved for, for men, for action heroes, for whatever that, uh, that can be applied to women. And I think just like on a literal, does this appeal to my eye level? Uh, it can be really, it can be really enriching to look at images of strong women. And, um, and then of course there's all this sort of, uh, subliminal stuff that, that goes along with that. Uh, you know, all the, the, the subtle cues that, that teach you as you look at these images that women indeed can and should be powerful. Yeah. And I don't know if it was, um, from your mind's eye or, or if this is sort of a, a collaboration with, with, uh, your collaborator, David Cruda on as a DP. And, but a lot of these shots come from sort of, um, uh, low and then up. So that it gives yeah. you the, the sense, the feeling that 
that not only is this woman powerful and dominant, but she's bigger than you as the viewer. And she's a, she's sort of above you. And I saw that motif happen in a couple of the commercials. And I think it's really brilliant. It really does actually, it does actually sort of chip away at your, <laughs> some of your subconscious a little bit, like you mentioned, it's, it's really brilliantly done. And so, so kudos to you. So you make this transition over to narrative and you do it in a big way. You have this award-winning short film occurrence at Arvine and Arvern, sorry. And uh, it's, it's just great. And I, uh, I know you've done some interviews about this. You've won some awards. You've been nominated for several awards across the country and across the world for this short film. You were immediately a premier staff pick on Vimeo for the short film. So how, uh, how is this recent acclaim different for you coming from that background? Well, I think the way you describe that acclaim feels a lot different than the reality feels. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's, it's as, as anything, but especially with a short film, um, you know, it's a labor of love and it's, it's, it feels like you're constantly pull, pushing the boulder up, up the hill. Um, I mean, it's nice. It's nice that there's been some recognition, but it's it's not an easy film. It wasn't designed to be an easy one. It was designed to be, you know, pretty confrontational. Um, and and that's that's like a violation of a basic tenet of entertainment. You know, people aren't desperate to escape uh, the world that confronts them every day by uh, seeking out more confrontation, especially confrontation that challenges possibly how they see the world and possibly makes them you know feel bad about it. Um, so I took, I took a calculated risk there and, um, and when it's been embraced, it's been great. Of course, people have said wonderful things, but there's, you know, there's a huge contingent of people who definitely roll their eyes, you know, whether it's because they are, you know, abundantly woke and it's sort of, you know, unnecessary for them to see whether they're from the black community, uh, and it's, you know, it's superfluous, um, or whether they just don't want to hear it, you know? Yeah, in the timing of it, um, what I right after the sort of the murder of George Floyd, and you're having there's this zeitgeist happening that's growing and building, and you know I've been was a part of some historic marches in in D.C. and and some of this uh, proactive movement around diversity and equity and inclusion. I continue to to do that work on the side, um, and I think there's a way to present the case for that without beating people over the head with it. And I know that some people do roll their eyes, Robert, but I actually think you took a very courageous route of not beating someone over the head with the idea, but letting, you know, letting it breathe. And so I've watched it many times and I get the sense that whatever we as the viewer believe happens after Marcus, which is played by Curtis Cook Jr. Who was amazing. Whatever we believe happens once he leaves the house, I'm curious, in your opinion, is that our, does that reflect our experience or our bias? I mean, it's open-ended uh, for the very reason that I can answer both um, or either. It's, I think, I think, I think, I, look, there's a big clue in the film and occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge. Um, I would say, look to that film. I'm not going to spoil it, but, but check that film out. It's a, it's a classic short film. Um, it's amazing. Uh, it was made in I think 1962 by Robert Enrico. Mm -hmm. It's an adaptation of an Ambrose Spears short story. And, uh, I think I was shown it in, you know, sixth grade history class or something and it stayed with me. Um, so, so that film has some direction in terms, in terms of, my interpretation of, of this film. Um, but I think, I think whatever a viewer wants to take away at the end, it's fair game. You know, I think for some people, so I've had people who are sort of um, desperate for something bad not to happen for the reason that they just don't want something bad to happen or for the reason that if it doesn't happen, then they feel like they've been let off the hook mm -hmm. for their bias. Oh, it's fine. I know, I know I, th I thought some, uh, pretty horrific things uh, about this character initially, but uh, everything's going to be fine. I'm fine. I'm off the hook. Um, and then other people, uh, yeah, I mean, other other people think the worst. So, 
Yeah, you kind of can catch the audience with this film with with their pants down. Honestly, they're they're ideological and bias or whatever. You know, there, there's. I'm watching it first just to look at the craft, and you're you're just a, a fantastic editor, and, and the simplicity of the film and the craft is something we're going to talk about for. Uh, just the sake of our audience as well, but the restraint to not show that, to not give it away to the audience there at the end so that they have this relief, this almost shrug of, ah, I see what's going to happen. And, and when you, when you had that restraint, which I thought was beautifully done and so smart. Now I was left with my experience. So I'm watching and said, okay, oh my gosh, this is going to be bad when he leaves. And then I thought to myself, why do I think that? Why do I feel like that's going to happen? I shouldn't have that in the back of my head. So it pulled something out of my subconscious into my conscious space. In so few films, especially in the short form, although short shorts are powerful for that reason, uh, do that and achieve that. So just, just super, super well done. Kudos to you. And I, I, I guess I want to, amend uh, to that statement by saying, uh, you know, what did you learn about your own bias and your own experience from, from making this film? You know, obviously I have no bias. I'm as close to perfect as perfect can be. <laughs> um, I, you know, there's a lot of talk uh, and, and I agree with the talk about um, racism being a white people problem, obviously. Um, it's, it's, it's a problem for everybody else. Um, but it's, it's a problem that it's on white people to solve because <laughs> we're the ones responsible. And, um, so, you know, having grown up in mostly white communities surrounded by mostly white people, I've, you know, I've had a front row seat to, uh, a lot of, a lot of bias across the board. And, and I've obviously, I'm not innocent of, of never having had any bias. I mean, you know, things between the media, between asides in conversations when you're a child from adults or, or explicit things that are said, you know, bias forms, right. It's, uh, it's going to be there. So I, you know, I, I had done a lot of work over, over the course of my life. Um, and some of it wasn't work. It was just the, the, course of living life and, and discovering that a lot of these biases are, are totally unjustified and, and absurd and, you know, sort of evil tools of fearful people. Um, but some of it was work, you know, some of it was, was, all right, I, I, I want to, I was very conscious that I, I had, I had been denied, um, you know, an education in, in black literature, black essayists, et cetera. And so, you know, I started reading James Baldwin and, mm -hmm other people and, um, and really sought the firsthand sort of, um, perspective of, of what it's like being on the receiving end. Um, and, uh, and that, that was invaluable and that really shaped a much more nuanced and deep understanding of, of how bias works and, um, how insidious it is and, and, uh, how deep rooted and that's a really long and, and, and not, pointed answer to your question, which I think was, um, how did it reveal my own bias? Um, or, or did it, I mean, what was, what, what did you learn from it? You know, I mean, in this particular yourself. case about, well, I learned more things about myself as an artist and a filmmaker than I did about, about bias per se. Um, I, I can tell you that, um, that I learned a lot about other people's bias and about how sort of the world perceives a project like this because of, <laughs> the delineation point of George Floyd's murder, you know, the film was finished and we had started submitting it to festivals and showing it to people, uh, before that happened. And, uh, there was a pretty universal nod to the craft, you know, it's, it's really well made, but the caveat was always, but why, what's the point? Like, why did you make this? Um, and, and to me, that was obviously devastating. <laughs> I felt it was totally essential and, and worthy and and the fact that that question was being asked um supported the rationale for making it you know people taking on a sort of post-racial but we had a black president uh point of view with regard to the film and then after george floyd um 
it changed. It, it became it became a master masterfully crafted and essential film to the people who responded to it, uh, and and many of those were the same people who thought it was really well made. But what's the point? Yeah, it's really fascinating because you could also view it and just simply assume that nothing happens. You know, like it could just be that he leaves and nothing happens. Absolutely. Um, and, and so, and that's the brilliant part about it. You've talked about this being a, a Rorschach test uh, of sorts. And now that you have accumulated all this data on all the people that have watched it, what does the data reveal? Um, what is the Rorschach test? What do we see uh, by and large? But yeah, I mean, the idea was to use white privilege to combat white privilege, really. You know, hopefully in, in the, the short space of the, the film's running time, learn something about how they see the world uh, in, in whatever capacity. And, you know, I would say a lot of people have have admitted to their bias as a result of seeing it. I will say that contextually it's been American audiences almost entirely. Um, I do read the comments and things like that on Vimeo and elsewhere. And uh, you know, people in England, there's a lot of resistance to it. Interestingly. That is Uh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. And um, I think, I think a lot of, a lot of the impact that it could have is dependent on cultural context because, you know, I don't supply a lot of information and there's not a conventional plot. Like if you take bias out of it, if you take the cultural baggage that we bring to it out of the viewing experience, it is, it's so inconsequential and boring. You can't believe it. Um, It's, it's a guy who goes into a house and leaves a house. He doesn't do anything. There's no meaningful conflict. There's no meaningful change uh, in his character in his life. It's not, it does not follow the sort of um, typical edict uh, of a short film. And, uh, and I think for a lot of people from cultures other than our own, um, even if there is prevalent bias or racism in those cultures, um, you know, they haven't had their George Floyd yet, or they, they didn't officially have slavery in a way that, that we had on uh, mass. Um, they, yeah, they don't, they just don't, they don't see it the same way. There's no impact. They see it as a pointless short film as opposed to something, you know, um, potentially revelatory for them. Right. Because some of the comments I, that I read, no, no one ever mentioned the fact, you know, that um, first of all, it's just so uh, accurate to life. Uh, it's the kind of situation as a black person, me, you know, growing up uh, in the South, it's the kind of thing my mom would warn me about. Hey, don't get yourself. I, I would be warned about this kind of stuff. Hey, don't, uh, if you get pulled over at night in this, in this town, this city, this is what you say. Um, you know, don't, uh, don't be the guy who's like doing a favor for somebody, uh, just like this character is doing, uh, the Marcus character is doing in, in your film. Like it, it, as I'm watching it before I realize even what the point of the short is, I don't even know how long it is. I'm just turning it on and watched it the first time. It really, I was just going through like, oh my God, he's doing all the like, <laughs> this is all the things your mom told you <laughs> yeah. not to do yeah. as a black person specifically. And that was so, you know, accurate. Um, you, you said something a, a moment ago that I do want to dig into, which is people asking you, well, why did you make this film? And it, it does beg the question a little bit because um, your earlier work is really with with high fashion, you know, uh, luxurious luxury, I, I should say brands. And now you have this shift into almost a social justice piece. So what accounts for this change in your creative expression? Great question. Um, and I'm going to put a pin in it for the moment because I do want to go back to what you just said, which, which I found really interesting um, and, and, and not surprising um, about your mom warning you not to get yourself mm-hmm. into situations like this, because mm-hmm. if, if there is one fiction to this film, it is that, our protagonist is even in the situation at all, because I think, and this was something that I talked about because I wasn't going to make this if I didn't have a black producer. So there were a lot of in-depth interrogations of me on the road to getting a producer, finding the right match, et cetera. And, and one of the, the things that sort of, I was initially double checking, but was pretty sure I was right about was that like, look, this is day one being black in America. Don't do shit like this. Don't go to the unfamiliar neighborhood. Don't go into the other house. 
you know, don't put yourself in this situation because it's, unfortunately it could wind up being lethal. Yes. Um, and, and so I, I knew that, but I was really trying to do my work as a white person speaking to other white people. And I know that white people wouldn't be as sensitive to that reality. <laughs> you know, they wouldn't know <laughs> that you just don't get yourself into that situation. Right. And, and there was a pretty strong consensus that exceptions are made, you know, if, if, if it's a really good friend and he's really in a pinch and you sort of do the calculations and determine, all right, this one might be okay. Maybe, maybe you make that exception. You do that favor. So there was some, there was plausibility. Um, but, uh, yeah, I knew, I knew that it was, that was sort of the one fiction of the film, if there was going to be one, um, back to your question about the shift from luxury fashion and makeup to, social justice. Um, you know, I went, my passion, uh, is, is filmmaking is, is telling stories about people and, and ideally ones that are, that are impactful to an audience, not necessarily in a social justice context, but, um, things that matter, things that, that engage people with the world and hopefully move the empathy needle, you know, a notch, uh, cause you know, that's, that's obviously films, great power, arts, yes. great power. Um, and you go to film school and you have ob financial obligations in life and opportunities come your way. And, you know, you want to work with Kanye West? <laughs> the answer to that is always yes. Well, there was a time when it was definitely always yes, for sure. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know if right now it's definitely yes for a lot of people. But um, for me, given those opportunities, you say yes. Do you want to shoot, you know, Kai Gerber? Do you want to do you want to do you want to sort of enter this world and, and create fictions there, you know, the answer is yes. And, and they're going to pay you for it. That said, the whole time I was doing that and sort of editing, a lot of it was really to support um, financial obligations and also to sort of give myself um, a base of craft um, that I could then direct to my actual creative endeavors that, 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 or what matter most to me. So it was a gestation period of like wanting to be confident because I was good enough, not because I was just confident, you know, wanting to build the skills and having the craft and all that sort of thing. And editing was, was a huge boon, even though I, I desperately wanted to be directing the whole time. And when I started directing, editing was a huge assist, you know, um, because I could, I could take opportunities that weren't really that great and, and make, you know, pretty solid work out of them and, and build from there. So, um, when, when I decided to make this shift, I had just gotten married. So I was thinking about, you know, more adult things, generally my responsibility to the world. What if I have kids, all these sorts of things. And what's my contribution to the world been so far? It, the answer cannot be some cool fashion content. Like that's not acceptable. Um, so I was, I was at a point where I really needed to make a, a personal project. I was also facing, you know, a lot of the usual categorization in the advertising industry about the type of director I am. Well, you're a fashion director, you're a luxury director. Um, well, I'm that because those are the opportunities I got and I have a facility for it, but I'm a lot more than that. And, you know, people think you literally cannot direct dialogue or actors, there's, there's a million things, anything that you haven't done, it is assumed that you cannot do. So number one, I wanted to make a, a personal film. Number two, if I was going to engage that pursuit, which I knew would be a bumpy road and, and really difficult and all that, um, it, it had to mean something. It had to matter. And I've been thinking obsessively about race and inequity in this country for a long time. Um, and so that made sense. Uh, and, and three, you know, I had to prove these, these people <laughs> to these people that I could do dialogue, as they say, I could direct dialogue. <laughs> I could work with actors. Um, you know, I'm not a big fan of this category categorization that, that is uh, so prevalent in the industry. I get it. I get why it's necessary and, and how it, it helps lubricate the gears of industry. But, um, but the reality is you got to, you got to go out there and, and do the thing in order to, to show them that you can. So there's a quote on your Instagram, uh, a post, sort of a picture of a quote 
that touches on this a little bit and it is New York kills artists. And then right below it, it says, you'll be fine then. <laughs> and I love that. It really speaks so much to it. There's a lot loaded into a statement like that. So I'm wondering, can you unpack that for me? And, and why did it mean so much to you, at least for you to <laughs> post it? It's, it's quirky, right? Like, but it, but there's a lot in there, isn't there? Yeah, I think there is. Um, I, I, you know, first of all, I think that was, I have very few Instagram posts and that was one of the very earliest ones. And that was it, like the bathroom of a dive bar. Um, you know, uh, New York, uh, let's say, okay. New York kills artists. New York is super gentrified as we know. Um, it is, it has changed a lot. If New York represents sort of, um, society at large, society's obsession with, uh, capital and material, and consumption, um, which I think it does. I think it's in many ways, the epicenter. Um, then it's the antithesis of art in many ways. Right. And also it just makes it impossible because art requires time, um, and space and resources. And if all of your time and space and resources are, are literally required to be, uh, making money, gaining property or whatever, just so you can have a toehold, in the city in which you live, then art will necessarily, uh, then New York will necessarily kill, uh, artists and art, you know, and, and the, you'll be fine then part is obviously the best, <laughs> the best <laughs> part of that statement. Cause at the time I, 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 I remember reading that and thinking, no, I won't. I, I'm an artist, I promise. And, um, you know, and at some point you got to make good on that. Um, I do think a lot of people, I think that the, 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 the power of the casual power of, of sort of capitalism, all the assumptions embedded in it um, does completely derail people. And I think for lots of totally valid non evil reasons, people, you know, lose the path. It's really, it's really hard to make art to begin with. It's even harder if you can't pay your bills doing it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It takes me back to something I've said many times on this podcast, but uh, the way this podcast actually started was was me and Nick walking around with my old journalism recorder and asking creatives, hey, what does it mean for you to make it? And in, inevitably, 80 plus percent of people said, I just want to pay my bills doing art. Now, if we take them at their word, then, then, then that's really what people want to do is they just want to live a life. They don't need to be rich or famous. They just want to live their life making their work. Now we can choose not to believe that and be cynical, but I think it starts with, if I'm going to do this, I have to figure out a way to do it and make it not a hobby, like find a way to, to pay the bills with it. But when, when I heard, when I read the quote, the first thing I thought was, yeah, New York can't kill artists because nothing can kill an artist. You're either, you either are, or you aren't, uh, you're either here to create and, and you can't help, but create or, or you're not going to. And so that's why that you'll be fine. Then works perfectly for me, because if you believe the first statement, then you're not what it says you are anyway. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know, uh, if I'm as binary on that. I mean, I think, I think I've adequately supported my position that New York can kill artists. So that would suggest <laughs> a belief in that statement. And therefore I am not an artist. Um, I think, look, I think it's perhaps uh, it can kill your spirit. Yes. It can kill your spirit. I think it's a serpentine path. We all travel. Right. And I think there, there are, there are times when people can lose their way and, and maybe that, that um, sets them, in a, in an even stronger way on their course when they, when they regain it. Um, and some people, yeah, I mean, you're right. It's not going to happen. They're not going to do it. There's a lot of you know, shit you need to deal with as an artist. Um, and, and as an art by artist, I don't mean somebody making fashion films, you know, I mean, somebody taking the time to explore and investigate their, their, their worldview or their feelings, whatever it happens to be and, and commit it to a medium and then show it to people. Yep. You know, it's, it's really hard and, and, and understandably a lot of people aren't cut out for it. And I don't think that, I don't say that pejoratively. I think it's, uh, it's really hard and it's not for everybody. And, um, you know, making art is like playing the lottery to get a lottery ticket. 
(laughs) (laughs) Well said. That's uh, what, that's a great quote. And And that's an insane, insane proposition. So, you know, there's, thank God there's not, more insane people out there because <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's uh, that part about pov is so critical um we, we talked about how good of an editor you are at least i did and i believe that to be true and the reason why it's uh, i'm bringing it up is because an editor has the power to make or break an actress performance they have the power to uh, make or break the pacing of a story and how a story is told so i've seen that jump where an editor will go to a director uh, a lot because in a way you're kind of already directing what the end product is going to be and you you talk a lot about this concept of coverage and and the inability to use coverage in this film um for people who don't know that are listening, talk to us about how coverage helps a filmmaker, helps an editor, especially if the performances aren't good or the location isn't good, um, et cetera. Right. Uh, so broadly speaking, coverage is, is the number of shots that cover a certain piece of action. Um, and coverage is helpful if you have it because let's say one angle on an action, on a scene, whatever it happens to be, isn't great. Uh, there's a technical issue with it. Um, you don't catch the expression of an actor's face or some sort of fundamental gesture um, in the shot. You know, if you have another angle to cut to, you're good. Um, another level of coverage is you know how many takes you get of each thing. So. Uh, maybe, maybe you don't have enough takes to get the actor there or to get the, to nail whatever it is you're trying to nail. So those, the, those two aspects of coverage are obviously huge because, you know, one enables you to sort of blanket the action, um, from various angles and you, and you got to pick the, the best one, of course, the most expressive one, um, the clearest one to your purpose. Um, and I say to your purpose because maybe your intention is not to be clear. Um, and then, you know, and then you need enough takes to, to get it right. Um, so coverage is essential and, and a lot of people shoot a lot of coverage and, uh, and a lot of coverage can often save things because it gives you options. You can, you can cut out parts of conversations. You can cut out bad parts of performance. You can you can really shape um, the perception of what's taking place in the film um, through coverage. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of coverage, to be honest. Mm-hmm. I think it's I think it's essential to get an essential cover. I think beyond that, unless you've got a gun to your head. Um, I haven't been in the situation, but from a studio. Uh, or from I have been in the situation an ad agency um, you know I think it's it's obviously better to to be really decisive in what you want to shoot and shoot that it shouldn't be you know it just forces you to be better with the script better with the actor better with where you put the camera how you move the camera all these things every single thing you're going to have to be better at if you know you don't have a safety net it sucks it is scary you will wish you had coverage sometimes but it forces a certain discipline in storytelling that I think is really important. Um, Tarantino has an awesome saying I love. He says, I'm a director, not a selector. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> I'm not here to pick from a bunch of different shots. I'm here to pick from the shot that I determined before we ever shot it. Right. You know? Right. Um, and I think that's legit. I think that's totally legit. I look, it's super efficient. If you've done your, if you have the advantage of having done your homework and prepared, um, it's a better way to go because you're going to, you're going to, you know, fart around less time in the edit and, um, and everybody's going to have a certain amount of pressure on them to get it right on set. You know, I love it. I love it. That whole idea of shoot what you need. Um, I love it. You, you have a quote and I want to read it here. Fancy expressive shots were off the table. And this is in reference to occurrence at Arvern. Fancy expressive shots were off the table. 
I would need to be extra vigilant to achieve the level of accuracy and restraint the story required just to get the experiment to the point where it merely might work. It would have been simple to achieve a complex result. So I want to focus on the last sentence of that quote. Talk to us about why it's simple to be complex in filmmaking. Um, I think uh, I, I don't want to make any sweeping generalizations about simplicity in filmmaking as a, as a means to complexity, but definitely for this, if I was sincere in my goal of making a sort of a blank canvas for people to project onto um, and then interpret, you know, their own projections, I couldn't, I couldn't tip my hat. I couldn't be too manipulative. Like, you know what I mean? I, I use certain language of cinema that I, that I, you know, that is the right stuff when you're, when you're building suspense and et cetera, et cetera, or is just good storytelling. I think it's good storytelling to not see, to not necessarily see the protagonist's face at the start of the film. You know, I believe in mystique. I believe in generating questions that you answer that are, you know, then followed up with more questions as you go. You want to constantly refresh the novelty. So some of the film, uh, the, the film certainly uses, you know, more conventional, uh, subjective cinematic techniques really in the beginning. Um, but after that, I had to play it pretty wide or at least pretty, pretty clear. I mean, you know, you, you essentially the shift is you go from not seeing this guy to seeing him, not seeing his face to seeing his face, uh, from closeness to openness. And so the tension is always, you know, between that initial ambiguity and the clarity that follows. Um, once you've moved into clarity, you got to stay clear. Like I could have, I would have loved to use really expressive lighting and, and cool angles and camera moves and things like that. But any of those things would serve to, um, to really to complicate things at that stage and to direct the audience to perceive things in a specific way. And if I do that, I'm breaking the experiment. I mean, Mm -hmm. I really had to be sincere and it kind of sucked to say like, all right, it's going to be another shot of this guy's face as he talks. (laughs) Cool. You know, like, well, can we get the curtains in the background? At least they're colorful, you know, just trying to add some visual interest to these really basic frames so that everything would be as straightforward as possible to the viewer so that the viewer could be making his, her, their own decisions about what was happening. Um, that was it. And so it ha- it really did have to be simple in order for the more complex result, which is you bringing whatever baggage you've got to the table. That's to me, that's complex. That is, look, it's something that happens in every film in every piece of art. Like you're going to bring whatever your experience is to that piece of art. Mm-hmm. But in this specific case, it was a very specific kind of baggage that people had to bring. And the complexity of it is, grappling with yourself and what you think, you know, um, based on your experience in a profoundly racist society. Yeah. It's one of the more fascinating things about film and the great filmmakers. Um, and this is, I would say equally fascinating and complex as you mentioned is the best filmmakers know and understand how the majority of people feel. And so when you, uh, on a given subject. So when you go to a film and you see a reversal, it, the reversal works because the filmmaker knew and the writer knew in advance how the majority of society is going to perceive something on the screen. And when it doesn't work, it's because you see something that you feel is inauthentic and you're like, wait, that's not how the world works. That's not how I, that's not my experience. Even if it might've been the filmmaker's experience. So the filmmaker and the writer might have a totally different world, but they're not in sync And then this is kind of like what it means to be out of touch where you write something that is like, (laughs) wait a second. uh, We don't feel that way. And you're, you're not writing to it. Yeah, Uh, totally. I, I 100% buy that. I think that's a nice encapsulation of the phenomenon. And yeah, I mean, when you get it wrong, it's just proof of tone deafness, you know? And, and, you know, my hope is that (laughs) at some point in time in the future, this will be considered 
utterly tone deaf, my, my little film. Yeah. Because people will be like, I don't, I don't get it <laughs> because, <laughs> because generations from now, possibly bias will be, you know, at sort of HIV manageable levels. Right. Um, right. Where, where it's not just killing everybody all the time. Right. We'll, we'll all be England. And <laughs> we're, we're just like, what is this? Or, or what uh, England thinks it is. Yeah. Right. Right. What exactly. What is this? It's a guy coming in the house and he left. Who cares? Uh, <laughs> uh, what, what are the two best pieces of advice you've received in your career and who did they come from? Uh, one, I'm still waiting for them. And two, mm. I'll let you know when I get them. Um, okay. I, I'll hold you to that. I, I honestly, I, I thought about this cause you know, you, you sent me some very helpful prep and, um, I, I would say, I would say these two things. One, uh, when I first got out of film school and I needed to pay the bills and I couldn't sort of sit around hustling, directing jobs. And I, I just needed, you know, income. I got an agent for editing and, and she said something that was, that was really true because at that time I had been sort of multitasking. I was, you know, one of those film school kids who I'd go shoot for, you know, Condé Nast and, and I, I would shoot and edit and direct and interview people and, and do all of the things. And she said, look, you're going to get further faster if you focus, if you concentrate on one thing. Um, and that's really true. So, you know, once I declared, Hey, I'm just editing, uh, it, as much as it pained me, I advanced, faster as an editor than I would have if I had been trying to get editing work as a jack of all trades. Obviously declaring myself an editor um, slowed me down from a directorial basis, but I do think whatever it is that you, you want to do, um, declare it and focus on it relentlessly because anything else could slow you down. If you need to do other things to pay the bills, if other opportunities come down the pike that are, you know, interesting or appealing. Um, I think do them if they're going to enrich you or if they're going to enable you to pursue the thing you actually want to pursue. But I think, I think declaring a, a concentration and pursuing it relentlessly is essential. Uh, another piece of advice that's pretty generic is, is to really as much as you can possibly do it, um, engage only in what you are most passionate about. Uh, so, you know, if you, if you've, if you're writing your own material, obviously write to your heart, not, not to what you think people might want, um, write to what's going to satisfy you and engage you as a, as a viewer and an artist. Um, and, and if you're directing same deal, you know, don't pick stuff that has a nice sheen to it, but you don't really connect with cause you're probably not going to do a great job. And if you do, you might feel pretty hollow afterwards. Yep. Uh, yep. And I can say that from experience. Here, here, because uh, there's so many times where we will talk ourselves as creatives into a project and why we will, it's good for us to do, even though we know it's not necessarily up our alley. And then I'll also quote a friend of the podcast and, and former guest, Brandon Hirsch, who said, not all money is good money. So uh, yeah. good, good, good stuff there. Uh, which creatives do you most admire and want to emulate and, and what do they do from a technical or skill standpoint that makes their work stand apart? That's a huge question. Um, uh, dead air, a killer. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to mumble while I, while I think to buy myself time. Um, I, I guess to, to confine it to filmmaking, um, God, there's, there's just so many, um, from Spike Lee to Christopher Nolan to Ingmar Bergman to, I mean, all, all of these people, um, I think, I think they have first and foremost, a passion to engage the world through, through art, which I think is essential. They have very clear taste and preferences. Um, and they're just always generating work. Um, and they're always trying to push the envelope, push the audience, push us, uh, to experience something more than we had before to consider something, uh, more broadly or deeply or both than we had before. Um, 
it, that is a, that's just a huge question. And I would like to give you an A plus answer, but I think you're going to have to settle for that B minus. Well, I love that. And believe it or not, I think that might be the first Spike Lee reference to or our answer in response to that question. And I think, first of all, dang, but you know, second of all, thank you for that. And we'll we'll take it. Um, You have been so generous with your time and and so open with you, with your opinions and thoughts. Uh, What's next for you? Feature films, uh, more shorts, screenwriting. It's a, it's a great question. Uh, I was, I was on deck to do some shadowing on some TV series. Um, and one was like kind of right before COVID lockdown. Mm-hmm. And that, uh, that obviously didn't happen. So COVID and the second one also was complicated by COVID. So, so those were two things that I was super looking forward to do and they're going to happen in the near enough future. Um, so I'd like to be, I'd like to be directing episodic television and, uh, and otherwise, yeah, I'm working on scripts and I'm trying to determine whether I'll make another short or make the jump to a feature. It is premature for me to make a declaration either way. Can you share the names of the, uh, episodics, the, the TV shows? I think that would be in poor form as much as I'd like to, but I can tell you they're both, you know, prestige shows that a lot of people watch. Well, I love that and totally understand and cannot wait to see, uh, uh, what that turns out to be. And, and if you're behind it, I know it's going to be great. Uh, tell everybody, Robert, where they can find you on social media and on the internet and maybe even where they can see your work. Uh, okay. Instagram. I have a very creative handle. It's at Robert Broadhurst <laughs> done easy. Uh, Facebook. Allegedly, I still have an account. Uh, that's not going to be a great route for you. If you ever want to find what I'm up to or where I am. Um, and I have two, I have, well, let's just stick with my main website, Robert directs.com also a super creative handle and the short film in occurrence at Arvern has its own website, which is occurrenceshortfilm.com. And there's everything you might need there about the team, press releases, press reviews. Uh, you can watch the film, of course, and uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty thorough. It's as thorough as I was able to make a short film website. Perfect. And we'll end on this. What's the best story idea that came to you while you were surfing? It's super meditative. I am like a, a, a dormant surfer. So I would have to really plumb the depths to find like a, a surfing idea, um, origination memory, but, uh, swimming. I mean, I probably had the idea for the short film swimming. I, I'm a, I love swimming, you know, when, mm. when, when the time is right, when it's not COVID, you know, I like to get in a few miles a week and, and that is also super meditative. Um, but, uh, it's a really good question because I would say most of my ideas, good ones or solutions to other ideas I'm working on come while I'm running or like at yoga or swimming, uh, any of those things. Uh, I, I find that the, the sort of physical aspect of being mentally and emotionally creative is really essential and a huge booster. Yeah, it's fascinating. I'm, I'm my most brilliant self if I'm out on a three mile walk or right or just doing something. Yeah, it, it's it's you're a man of my own heart in that way, and uh, I love this idea of you going to the ocean uh, to to get the creative out and and to solve a problem. Another trick I use is I will think deeply about a problem I don't have the answer to right before I go to sleep, and then when I wake up, the answer invariably seems to be there upon waking within about five minutes. So anybody listening to that, that wants to try that technique, please let me know how that works out. It's legit. (laughs) I'm telling everybody it's legit. Uh, It almost never fails. That's, that's exactly right. Um, I I love it. And, and I love this conversation. Uh, I hope we get around too. Uh, yeah. And, and Robert, I wish you the best of luck. I know you don't need it, but I wish you the best of luck in everything that you have going, um, 
uh, for you in the future. Uh, we will definitely keep our ear to the ground on everything that you're up to. Like I said, hopefully we get around to, and uh, please do stay in touch. Yeah, thank you so much. This is incredible. You have a great, great thing going here, and I'm, I'm honored to be a part of it. Honor is all ours, and I'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks so much. All right, brother. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to the Make It Podcast. To find more information about this week's topics, including links to relevant blog posts, projects, and indie creatives, please visit our website at www.banzai.film. If you haven't already, you can join our podcast community on Apple Podcasts or the podcast app of your choice by searching for Make It Bonsai Creative and the show will pop right up. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at underscore Bonsai Creative and Facebook by searching for Bonsai Creative. And of course, if you're looking to take a big step towards your filmmaking success, go to www.bonsai.film and click on Book Us to schedule a free discovery meeting and needs assessment. You have everything to gain. Until next time, be better, be creative, be engaged, and thank you for listening.